Some of you may be wondering why I'm not wearing my usual diaconal vestments. Well, this is Religious Life Sunday, and I want to share some thoughts about my other calling as a professed member of the Anamkara Fellowship, where I am known as Sister Sheila Bridget. I suspect that many of you do not know that the religious orders even exist in the Episcopal Church. A religious order in the Episcopal Church is defined as the society of Christians who voluntarily commit themselves for life or a term of years to holding their possessions in common or in trust, to live a celibate life in community and in obedience to their rule and constitution. These brothers or sisters usually live in a monastery or convent. There are currently 12 Episcopal orders for women, six for men, and one for men and women. Unfortunately, many of them are shrinking in membership, and several have less than five members. While traditional orders are shrinking, religious communities are growing. Most of these communities are dispersed, which means members live in their own homes and are self-supporting. Each community has its own constitution and guidelines for its members. And these communities must seek recognition from the House of Bishops before they are officially recognized as Episcopal communities. There are currently 15 such communities and four more seeking recognition from the House of Bishops Committee on Religious Life. The Anamkara Fellowship was founded in 2003 by Sister Barbara Jean Brown, better known as Sister BJ, Sister Julian Wilson, and the late Bishop John Smith, who had served as Bishop of West Virginia and was Sister BJ's spiritual director. Now in today's gospel reading about from Mark, we learn how Jesus chose his apostles. As Jesus passed through the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and he called them and left, they left their father Zebedee, and they followed them. Well, the history of the forming the Episcopal uh, Order, the Anamkar Fellowship, is somewhat different. Back in the year 1882, the Sisterhood of the Holy Nativity was founded by the Reverend Charles C. Grafton, who at that time was rector of the Church of Advent in Boston. He was also chaplain to the Society of St. Margaret, which was, and St. Margaret's was a nursing order that had started in England. And they had come to Boston and he had been working with them. Well, Bishop Grafton decided he wanted to start a new order. And so he got three of the professed sisters and three of the novices from St. Margaret's and got them to form Holy Nativity. And that order was initially in Boston, and then Father Grafton was made the Bishop of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and when he went to Fond du Lac, they went with him. Fast forward ahead to 1970s, when a young woman named Barbara Jean Brown joined the Sisterhood of the Holy Nativity as a novice. And she was sent out to do youth work in many places, including West Virginia and other states, and finally in California. She also led many retreats throughout the country. In the 1990s, Sister Julian Wilson, who had been a pharmacist, joined Holy Nativity, and she and Sister BJ began to work together. Well, the superior of Holy Nativity decided there was a need to update the constitution and guidelines of the order, and they assigned the task to Sister BJ. However, the Holy Spirit led her in a different direction, and she wrote what would be the foundational documents for the forming of the Anamkara Fellowship. 
In 2002, Sister BJ and Sister Julian left Holy Nativity to form a new type of monastic community. They had been working at Holy Nativity's guest house in Santa Barbara, California. And their first challenge was to find employment because when they were living in the convent, all their expenses and needs were covered by the order. And once they went out the door, they had nothing. And literally, just really the clothes on their back. So BJ got offered a position to be do education work at Christ Church Christiana 100. And I feel she must have felt like Jonah when she's in Santa Barbara, California, and walks out the door and suddenly she's accepted a job on the other side of the country. Well, they traveled across the country in a small truck along with their meager possessions. And while Sister BJ did Christian education work at Christ Church, Sister Julian trained to be a hospital chaplain and later worked at Christiana Care. Well, they had met with the bishop when they first arrived in 2002, and he made them wait a year before he would take their vows. But he took their vows in June of 2003 and gave them permission to seek members for their new community. Well, as soon as the sisters opened their nets, five of us jumped in. Two of the seekers had known Sister BJ from retreats that she led at their parish in Virginia. The other three of us had gotten to know Sister BJ during her work here in the diocese. On June 9, 2004, which is St. Columba's Day, five of us were closed as novices, and I took Sister Celia Bridget as my religious name. Three of us were then professed in early 2006 and another later that year. The other novice who had been closed with us left the fellowship because she felt called to other things. Amazingly today, three of the first novices are still active in the fellowship. And one sister, Sister Suzanne Elizabeth, she died a couple of years ago, is now serving in the heavenly host. The Anamkara Fellowship has grown over the years, and we now have 38 professed members, four novices, and four seekers. We also have 35 companions who are similar to associates of other orders. So we started as a small group in Delaware. We now have members in 18 different states, and one in Scotland, and one in Brazil. It is interesting that the psalm appointed for today is one of the psalms that the Anamkara Fellowship uses in their service for clothing a novice. At that service, the aspirant comes wearing their street clothes and their street attire. And during the service, they leave and they're taken to another room and they put on their habit for the first time. And while they're getting prepared, those of us left in the church are re reading Psalms 62 and 63, verse after verse. And if we get all the way through 63 and the aspirant still has not returned, we go back and start again. But when the novice returns in their habit, the reading of the psalm stops just right where you ever you stop. And that verse is the verse this is a special verse forever for that member of the fellowship. Unfortunately, when I was clothed, we were the first group and we came to our service pre-clothed in our habits. So the original one of us, we just take the first verse. And this is also the service when the novice first tells people what their religious name is going to be. We get to choose our own, so it's very special. Belonging to a dispersed community requires a lot of personal discipline and a supportive family. 
one must assume a pattern of prayer, which includes morning and evening prayer and compliment each day. And some of us have formed small groups that do services together on Zoom. And I'm part of a group who live in the Eastern or Central time zones that get together every night and do evening prayer, seven days a week. Other groups join for morning prayer or compliment. And since our members live throughout the country, groups have formed in various time zones to fit member schedules. And we also, each is assigned to a, a priory group, which is a subgroup that meets monthly. These used to be for, from where you lived and everybody was in the same group, but we're so spread out, they're all done on Zoom too. Each year, our members get together for our annual gathering, which is held in Detroit, Michigan. It's like a great big family reunion where we gather to worship and study and play. And some of our members are no longer able to attend due to physical problems or other personal issues. And so we, like this church, have purchased a lot of equipment so that our gathering can be broadcast to our other members who were able to be there in person. My goal today is not to convince you all to join a religious community, but rather to make you aware of them. And you all have an insert in your bulletin about religious communities, and you, if you look cl closely at the top picture, which was a gathering of people from all different communities, you will see Sister Jackie is right there in the picture, who was a longtime member of our parish and now is up at Church of the Advent in Kennett Square. But religious orders have benefits that are available to all of you. They lead retreats, teach about prayer, give spiritual direction, and can help you on your spiritual journey. And of course, residential orders are also places for making retreats. Sister Ellen Francis of the Order of St. Helena says, those living under religious vows in the Episcopal Church are the best kept secret. I'm thankful to have this opportunity to share that secret with you. And I'm always happy to talk about religious life. In closing, I'd like to share with you this prayer for monastic orders and vocations. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you become poor for our sake that we might be made rich through your poverty. Guide and sanctify, we pray, those whom you call to follow you under the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, or the vows of their dispersed community that by their prayer and service they may enrich your church, and by their life and worship may glorify your name. For you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>